Howdy guys, I'm Jeep and Jason, and today, this video, we are going to tackle this rather large list of repairs and do a, basically a 10 year, 100,000 mile-ish service on the Auto Edits 2013 Jeep Wrangler right here. Now get over here so we can go through the parts and get busy. First, I want to say thanks to all the folks that watched the last video where I used my new endoscope camera to find out that my oil cooler housing was leaking. I, there was so much good advice in there on things to order and things to look for. I just love that about the internet and especially the community here on the Auto Edit channel. Thank you. Uh, let's get going. I'm going to go ahead and do upper and lower radiator hoses. I'll put a, a list in my Amazon store, so in the link. Everything that I ordered here actually came off of that one shopping list on Amazon. So that should help give anybody an idea of the items that I use and then we'll, I'll know how they do. I got the AC Delco hoses. I got some coolant. Now you wanna make sure that you get the right coolant for the Jeep that you're working on. 2013 and up uses OAT, O-A-T, generally orange. Moving on from there, something that gets overlooked a lot is radiator cap. I got an 18 pound radiator cap and it's something that people forget to replace. So do that. Got thermostat housing. So I got the Dorman PCV valve. We'll see how that goes. I went ahead and got all new coil packs. Now I went with the Bosch because according to my research, these are the exact ones that Mopar uses. Now, since the budget was kind of spiraling out of control, I did cheap out in one area. I got some E3 spark plugs. Now these are the E3.82. That's the one for the 3.6 Pentastar engine. And I got these mostly because they were cheap, $6.99 a piece. Last up, we got the Dorman aluminum housing oil cooler set up here. Uh, seems fine. I got it for, I think, a really good price. This is 205 bucks on Amazon right now. The part I have in there is leaking. I can't wait to get it out and see where the fail point was in there. Pretty sure since I had that camera and I was able to actually look inside there that the housing wasn't cracked. It's gonna be one of the seals that goes on the bottom here. So that comes with all of its gaskets and things like that here. Let's start taking stuff apart. On a project like this, when you're gonna be unplugging and plugging in a lot of sensors and connectors, disconnect your battery first. So I always do the negative terminal on that. Now, let's get the noise cover and vanity cover off and get going. Since I'm doing a coolant flush, I'm gonna go ahead and drain the coolant from this lower, uh, Petcock, and the way I'm gonna do that is you put like a 3 8 inch fuel line on the bottom of that thing, and then you can turn this little valve here and it should start draining. The intake manifold has six bolts that attach to brackets for stability. Four on the driver's side and two on the passenger side. Here's a quick tip on how to get all those hoses off the intake manifold without causing damage to the plastic. Carefully grab them with some pliers and twist back and forth a few times. You'll feel them break free and then you can safely pull them off. I'm gonna remove the bracket on the passenger side just to make my life easier when we eventually wanna to get to coil packs and spark plugs. There are two sneaky 10 millimeter nuts that can be reached from the inside wheel well. One more thing to do while you're down here is to look at your valve cover gasket to see if there's any really awful leaks and thank goodness, knock on exhaust header, that looks good. Oh, that'll be fun to clean up before putting it back in. So I'm gonna to try to take the lower intake with the fuel rails on it. So that means unplugging the fuel line. So I'm gonna put a rag under this fuel line just in case we get a little bit of a gusher. But for now, what we do is we just gently try to release the blue. Ooh, okay. Can you see that? 
Dare I say this is going pretty good. Clip almost off. Clip is off. We should be able to get the line off now. So there was a little bit of a spray. Nothing dramatic. And the fuel line's off. So now let's get it out of the way. I'm just gonna put a little rubber cap on this just to keep it from being a geyser. Let's start getting our coil packs free just because we can. Get these out of the way. Let's get our pick. We'll carefully pull the red tab up. I'm gonna go across since I have the pick in position. And then these should pull up. I always find if you give a little push down as you pinch the release, it helps a little bit. See that? Push, squeeze, and then pull up. Now we'll get our little doohickey here. And that can go all back there for now. And that clears this all up. Since I've drained most of the coolant already, I thought it would be nice to get the heater hoses out of the way. And sure enough, it wasn't very dramatic. And it'll be nice to have the space. Time to get this bad boy off. So we'll go ahead and buzz these eight millers. I called them eight millers, they're eight millimeters. And there is one more Christmas tree back here. And lower intake should come off. See, this is the benefit of removing a bunch of junk is that that just came off that easy. Pretty grimy down in there. The intake valves look really quite good inside there. I'll vacuum all this. We're gonna do a big cleaning before we do anything, but it looks good. Very grimy down inside there. Let's get the oil cooler out and just keep on moving. This is kind of fun. I stuffed some paper towels into the intake ports to keep debris out of there. And now it's time to pull the oil cooler. This will require the only unique tool I didn't have, and that's an E8 socket. It's cheap, and the one I used will be in the Amazon shopping list. Yank that dang filter housing out, making sure to leak a last bit of oil onto some other stuff. And then, time to start cleaning. My favorite. I used my brake bleeding hand pump to suck the oil out of the galley and hit the surrounding areas with my shot vacuum and a hearty dose of parts cleaner, a brush, and a Scotch-Brite pad. Came out pretty clean. As you can see, it's one of those rare rainy days here in Southern California. I love it. So I've been doing some, most of the work with the garage door shut, but right now we're gonna do some cleaning. Since we got some uh, good cleaning work on the inside, let's get these parts ready to go. A uh, couple quick tips. Uh, I use rags. Uh, cheapy paintbrush is a really handy thing to get nooks and crannies once we get going. The products I use, Toolbox Buddy, which has also been called the uh, Penetrating Oil by Lucas. I have that, all of this stuff in my Amazon store. Uh, engine, this is your secret weapon, my secret weapon, gunk. Original formula engine degreaser is magic. Once you're satisfied with clean components, it's time to transfer the sensors from the original oil filter housing to the new unit. During my forensic analysis, I looked for obvious cracks in the original housing and couldn't find any. I think the oil leaks simply came from worn seals. It's spinning inside the housing. Of course, one of mine had to put up a pretty good fight. I ended up having to use a chisel to free it from the plastic housing and a cutoff wheel to get the collar off without damaging the threads. Yay! Whew, crisis averted, barely. I then transferred the sensors into the new Dorman unit and torqued the cooler down to spec.
With fresh parts in hand, I installed new gaskets on the dormant housing. Those go in dry, but the O-ring needs a little oil to prevent damage during deployment. Carefully set that thing in place and torque the bolts down to 106 inch pounds in a cross pattern. Connect the sensor wires and make sure your coolant hose is secured in position. Here's where I'll grab the shop vac again to make sure no extra junk escapes down the intake ports. Oh, speaking of, check out how good it looks down in there. I've been routinely using the fuel injection cleaner every tank full and this must be evidence of it working. Now, put the new gaskets on the lower intake and set it into place. Again, tighten using a cross pattern to 106 inch pounds. Keeping in mind, all of this intake stuff is plastic and appreciates a little finesse when dealing with it. I'll put a towel down and call it good on this part of the job for now. Finally, it's time to get moving and tackle a bunch of other things on our list. Next up, I figure we'll do the PCV valve because that is gonna be another unfortunate thing because that is when you're looking from here, right down in there, I'll see if I'm gonna put a finger on it. That's it right there. That's actually the top bolt for it right there. And to remove it, the stock one is a T25. So that's what I'm gonna to use to get that off of there. And then luckily the Dorman one comes with a nice little eight millimeter normal bolt to put that thing back together. So let's pull that out. That wasn't as awful as I've seen videos on the YouTubes, but it wasn't pleasant either. That's really awkward. And I use those two little versions of the T25. So it wasn't leaking around the seal, but there is quite a bit of oil inside here. So it definitely was letting a lot of oil through here. And here is the comparison. Let's get this thing in. After a quick surface wipe down, I stuffed the new PCV in place and threaded the bolts. Having the upper intake manifold off makes this so much easier. The benefits of doing a while I'm here job is in full effect. Let's do some tune-up type stuff next. Spark plugs and coil packs coming right up. There's no fancy finger work needed here. Just a 10 millimeter socket and a good tug will remove the coil packs and a 5 8 socket with an extension will make easy work with the plugs. I'm one of those guys that likes the peace of mind of using just a dab of anti-seize on the plugs before torquing those down to 14 pound feet. Not as tight as you'd think. The spark plug gap on the old plugs was just over 50 thousandths. New is about 43, so they were worn, but not worn out by any means for 80,000 miles. Make sure there's some dielectric grease in the new plug boots, these came ready, and then you can button up the ignition refresh. Next, we'll tackle the item that actually threw an engine code a while back and inspired this whole shindig. Oftentimes, a P0128 can be resolved by replacing the thermostat, and most of these come integrated into the housing. So, two 10 millimeter bolts get the old one off, clean up the surface a bit, and bolt the new one on. Easiest replacement we've done so far. I'll go ahead and swap the new radiator hoses into service while I'm there, and I'm happy with the shape and fit of these AC Delco tubes. Start getting your wiring harness into position and plugging things back together. The fuel line gets reattached at this point. And don't forget the foam insulating pad on the driver's side valve cover. If you want that thing back in there, I do. Wrangle some new gaskets onto the lower intake manifold and set the upper plenum in place. Cross pattern torque it to 89 inch pounds. Our lightest force so far. Rear manifold, foam pad, and engine cover mounts go on next, followed by the passenger side valve cover bracket. Reinstall the heater hoses and connect any wires or vacuum lines you might have removed. Air inlet tube goes back in as well as the coolant reservoir. Now, how about a good old fashioned oil change? I like that the Dorman filter housing cap is orange and has the part number of the filter right on there. It uses the 2015 and up filter with the bypass built in.
Well, I'm having a really bad night. Went to start it after putting some oil in just to get some oil circulation in there. I was excited and the oil light came on immediately and I heard gushing out from underneath it. And sure enough, it filled up the galley with oil and it just literally puked all the oil out of this thing underneath. It's a huge mess. I don't know exactly what's going on. One of the seals must have blown out or one of the sensors must have blown out on that thing. So it's time to go all the way back in there to get, look, get a look at the oil cooler housing. And yeah, it's a huge bummer, um, but it's real. And uh, I thought right now we'd be doing a, a test drive, you know, a celebration test drive. And uh, I'd be showing you guys how to burp the coolant system and get all of the fun stuff done, but no. And I even utilized my new endoscope and took it down in there. And sure enough, yeah, it, the galley is filled with fresh, pristine oil in that really clean galley that we just spent all that time cleaning. So, ouch, this one hurts. All right, going back in, but not tonight. Wouldn't you know it, I was much faster the second time getting down into there. Uh, I left the fuel line connected this time, not like last time. And of course you could see all of this fresh, brand new expensive oil sitting down in there. Much fuller than it was before too. So this one, it was a gusher and the, the light was on. This sucks. Deja vu, we're gonna try a different technique here. I'm gonna use the old gear oil fluid pump. Working like a charm. That is a lot of oil. Status update in the urgency or need of urgency to get this thing back going, get this video done. I went ahead and ordered another Dorman housing. And let me bring you in and show you the two of these things. There's quite a bit of difference in the castings here. Like look at all the slag on this one here and all. And it just, both of them are the same, but different. And I wish I had more uh, confidence, peace of mind in this install, but I don't. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and install the new one that I just ordered. I'm going to return this one. I couldn't find any obvious things leaking and you want that. I'm not going to use the Felpro. Look at their slightly different sizes. So this is for the stock housing. This will not get work for the Dorman. So I'm going to use the Dorman one in the new housing here. And we're going to get this on get this installed. I would like more peace of mind in something that goes this deep into the galley, but I'm not gonna get it. So we're just gonna send it, put this one inside, see if we can get this thing running, get the radiator filled, <laughs> get this thing back on the road. All right, last sanity checks. Let's go ahead and Whew, I'm relieved. Let's go see what we got going on here. I don't have coolant in it yet, so I don't want to run it too long, but there's no oil pressure light. It sounds good. Oh, I feel so much better right now. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and cut it off, put a gallon of coolant in, and then we'll go ahead and flip it around and burp the system. All right, so here we go. We're gonna go ahead and utilize this thing. I've never used one of these before, so let's put that on and start to fill. Let's just finish this off. Now you can see that there's bubbles down in there. So it's bubbling and it wants more. So let's add more. So the key is to continually prime it till it's full, no more bubbles. And that's how you know your system is happy. So let me show you what I look for inside here. And that's, uh, I feel hot air coming out of the heating vents. You wanna make sure again, I don't think it matters what fan speed. I've seen people say you gotta have it on high. I don't, I don't know if that matters, but it's on high. Definitely just want it on max heat because you want as much coolant going through that as possible. Temperature is fine and up to uh, operating temp still. Let's give it a few revs. Mm -hmm. 
Everything is going very good so far. Temperature's locked in right there. So we'll just continue to watch the bubbles. All right, I'm officially at the point where when I squeeze the upper radiator hose, no big bubbles come out of that thing. I think we're gonna call that good. All right, I kind of like this thing. Let's go ahead and put the radiator cap on. Now here's the cool thing. We'll be able to take this off, hopefully without making a huge mess so far. I'm gonna put our cap on. Also, don't forget to fill your coolant reservoir with your fresh stuff. I just realized I have an awesome way of filling it right here. Look at us. Okay, this thing is uh, worth the 20 bucks right here. Well, I took the Jeep out for a quick rip and the test drive went perfect. Hot air comes out of the heater, engine stays the right temperature, runs exactly the same. Which brings me to my rundown of what we just did. So we could just check off the last few things, oil change, radiator, cab, radiator, fill, funnel. And it's a bummer when you spend a huge amount of money on routine maintenance and a kind of a lame repair, a bummer of a repair down in there. But my Jeep's 10 years old, 80,000 miles. It's been really quite reliable. So doing this every 10 years, not a big deal in the scheme of things. Quick rundown and takeaway from some of the products and parts we've used. Now, uh, quick while I'm here, the Felpro gaskets, just they're obviously the wrong side. Don't waste your time on ordering different gaskets if you're doing the dormant housing. Let's come back to the dormant housing. Super bummer to uh, not have peace of mind with the thing that you stick way down inside the galley. I hate that, I hate that. So I am gonna just absolutely say, do not go with the dormant. I'm not gonna put it on my Amazon store. Um, I just hate not having the confidence on the part that's gonna be so far down in there. I would just say go with Mopar part. The plastic didn't break on mine. It wasn't a failure point, it was the seals. So just put new seals on. Get, the, get these seals and put it on your stock cooler if the cooler is not broken. So that's my takeaway on that one. Hope you guys enjoyed the gunk trick, making the engine look pretty in an easy way and detail and make everything look nice, the gunk engine cleaner. Uh, this thing, the funnel, was an absolute hit. I can't believe I haven't used these prior to this uh, burping and the mess that I've made. So this major hit. And last but not least, I had I did a little glove comparison. I've always loved the Grease Monkey Bones nitrile gloves. I swapped it up for the last part of the install with the Gorilla Grip gloves because I did a little sponsored segment in a, for Instagram uh, last month. And it's funny, I actually really liked wrenching with these things, but for just on and off ease, I'm still a fan of these. And the bones, uh, this graphic on it just, it makes me happy, so I like it. But these actually were a little bit more dexterous and a little bit easier to work with uh, inside there and a little cooler. Like these, once you get a little coolant and a little oil on them, they'll, they'll kind of clam up on you. So give yourself a whole weekend. If you're gonna be dumb like me and try to tackle this much stuff at once, I just found that having the intake manifold out did make some of these other things, like the PCV went very, very easy. Obviously you have to have that off to do the coil pack and the plugs. So it was kind of nice to tag team a few of those things, but it's, it's a bigger job than I thought for sure, especially having to do it twice. Thank you guys so much for watching. I'm so stoked if you were watching this part of the video, that just means a ton to me. So thank you really from my heart. Uh, I hope you get out on the trails, enjoy some jeeping, and until next time, enjoy your drive. Whew, I have a big mess to clean up now. Yeah.